Well, thank you very much, Father Filippi, for joining us on such short notice. I know you have to travel tomorrow. It's a joy to see you again and to have you again uh, in front of the Orthodox ethos, uh, let's say, uh, community. Uh, and uh, to see you again after so many months after the conference. I, I understand you're uh, not far from me. You're yes. coming from, from, from Los, An Las Vegas now, yes? Yes. Uh, and you're going to be traveling soon. So thank you so much. I wanted to talk to you today about something which is at the heart of our life and the, the aim of our life, which is theosis. And it's very, I think, probably misunderstood, if not even just not understood at all, or not, even under, not even talked about among many people who consider themselves to be disciples of Christ. They don't even talk about it very much. And if we do talk about it, usually it's just a, I think most people think is, what is that theosis? Is something up in the stars maybe or something you know, that only theologians talk about? Or maybe it's it's this idea that's very exalted, but what does it have to do with me? And so this would, it would be a good opportunity to let's unpack it so people can understand our life as a constant journey or constant uh, goal of achieving or arriving, rather, at theosis. Uh, the fathers and, and, and other writers like Elder George Gregorio, he ta they talk about, of course, in the fall, we have the fall of man from the relationship in the garden, and, and the, the fathers talk about, in the fall, the image of man. Of course, it says in Scripture in Genesis that man is, is created according to the image and the likeness of God. Mm -hmm. And then we, in the fall, we, we lost the likeness, of course, and mm -hmm. the image was darkened, said the fathers mm -hmm. say, the image was darkened. Now the Lord comes into, into history, and he brings to us restoration and healing, which mm -hmm. is the restoration of the image of God in us. It's cleaned, it's purified, it's brightened, and it's no longer darkened. But the process of going now from that restoration of the image in baptism, chrismation, and communion to the likeness necessarily means our participation, our synergy, our, uh, our uh, goodwill and struggle, our asceticism. Otherwise, it would be more like the Calvinist idea of him imputing or imparting to us salvation and it would be without our will or our necessarily our participation and our struggle, which would be uh, very different and not a loving relationship. So in Orthodoxy, in, in the church for 2,000 years, we've talked about theosis, which means basically the restoration, being called to re, be restored to the likeness, the image to the likeness. Uh, is that a good way to, to begin the discussion? Yes, Father. First, um, I, I thank you uh, and I thank God for sustaining you in, in all your struggles and all your um, endeavors. Um, we cannot deny that such tasks that you are you have been pursuing for many years is only possible unless God blessed it. And mm -hmm. um, we have heard from many people um, how much they have been helped by the Internet this kind of discussion, particularly during pandemic, because that's the time that they had more time to learn about the faith. And because of necessity of their situation, they understand that this kind of sad or disturbing situation can still be a venue for sanctification, for healing, and most importantly, what we're, we're, we're supposed to be discussing about theosis. Mm. Uh, that's true. And as what I have mentioned also to some people that I've talked to, theosis is the essential aspect of orthodoxy. Unfortunately, that is often neglected in terms of, of all dialogues, dialogues with heterodox, dialogues among orthodox. And people are busy with so many things. And I think in the recent um, conference, the first grace field conference that you you have prayerfully and diligently crafted and well attended 
I think this awakens the people with the understanding that there should be more in the church. Mm. There, more than the incense, more than the mere streaming icon, more than hearing the Byzantine um, chanting in English, nicely, beautifully, there should be more than this. And this something more, it is often people don't delve much into. And this is the aspect which I mentioned um, to many other people that armchair, um, armchair theologians are silent about. Mm. Because first, theosis is experienced only within the church. Mm. You cannot make it up. <laughs> you, no one can, no one can pretend to be elder Saproni. No one can pretend elder Paisios. No one can pretend elder Ephraim. Mm. Their life is transformed into Christ, mm. and we are witnessed by it because they produce the spiritual fathers. Mm. A professor in a university can teach for twenty-five years. And he can produce another professor. He can produce another teacher, but not an enlightened one. That's the mm. problem when people neglect theosis and start thinking that, oh, I will learn theology by reading professor so-and-so or by subscribing to a particular person. But theosis is subscribing to the very person of Christ who was incarnated. That's the very important aspect of the, the theosis. It is in the incarnation of Christ, mm. and that would, because when we talk about incarnation of Christ now, all problems like Calvinist, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and all other forms will be settled, because for them Christ came because committed we committed sin, but the mm. church will clear Christ came, He was made into the flesh through the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Birth. So we can be like him. Mm. Yes, it, it, and if you begin with the ultimate goal uh, at, let's say, a almost horizontal level. Mm-hmm. So, you're if your if your goal is all, always to be horizontal, you and you're not called to ascend to the great heights. Well, then, those Christian life very quickly becomes. A very mundane and human, and uh, loses its attraction, and and the ethical life falls apart, and all the rest. On the other hand, I think many people, uh, when they think about theosis, maybe they think about it is so out of reach. They put it so out of reach, uh, and there's something wrong with that. That their perspective. What? How would we describe what's wrong with their perspective if they? It, because it's it's. Counter, uh, it would be contradictory for man, God to become man, to empty himself, to take on our flesh, to die, rise, send, send the Holy Spirit, establish the church, and then say, yes, but the salvation I give you is so out of reach that you can't get to it. There's something wrong with this thought. But I think many people have this idea that when they hear theosis, they think, well, that's only for five people in every generation or something. That's, that's actually the worst problem that we have. That's, that's how the demon of ignorance um, victimizes us. Christ mm. made it very possible for each and every one of us. That's why I always tell people, if I will choose a gospel pericope, which I will memorize for the rest of my life, I will choose... The conversation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with the Samaritan woman. Mm. Imagine the holy apostle and evangelist John, who is not known for writing in details, who is not known for writing like in a plain language. He, he, this is the longest conversation recorded in human history that mm. the Lord appeared, uh, manifested in the flesh. Mm. There's no recorded conversation between the Apostle John and Christ that long, Apostle P. No other. But, mm. but what kind of woman is this? What kind of woman? This woman is a woman living in shame. The station why she has to go there at the heat of the sun. It's, it's easier for her to, to endure the scorching heat like here in Las Vegas or in Florida rather than the judgmental eyes of people. 
Mm. She was an adulterer and an, a, a heretic. But mm. the Lord extended, made theosis possible even to her. Mm. So there's no excuse for us. We cannot say, oh, this. That's why, it's, that's why it's always good to learn from the saints. Saint Gregory Palamas did not, he always very clear, there's no distinction in terms of call for holiness, for monastic, and for the married people. Unfortunately, some some priests, some clergy, confused in their understanding of the faith, would claim that, no, this is just for monks, or this is just for married people. Hmm. The, the, there's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. I just heard the, this a few days ago from someone who called me and said, my, my, my priest, I like him very much, but he's told me something that uh, is, Father, is it true? And I said, what did he say? He said, well, he said that Jesus' prayer is not for you. It's only for the monks. And I said, well, that's very strange because St. Gregory Palamas himself came down from the Holy Mountain, went to Thessaloniki in the city, sat and taught the people the Jesus prayer and wrote very clearly that it is for all Christians. Every single Christian is to learn and to acquire unceasing prayer. So it, there is either great ignorance or some kind of distortion that's being passed around, and it's unacceptable. As Orthodox, we would never uh, create a two-tiered salvation. There's not two paths. There's only one, one gospel, one path. And uh, in, in, it's very dangerous because Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaking about the Judaizers who were, who were essentially trying to keep their traditions as Jews, but not realizing that the type had now fallen away and the fulfillment had come. They were clinging to the type, circumcision and other things. And he said about them who were not denying Christ, but were uh, wrongly uh, clinging to that which had been fulfilled and done away with, he said they were preaching another gospel. So we're in danger if we create two gospels, two roads, two paths, we're in danger of, of falling into delusion and heresy and leading people not on the path of salvation. So it is extremely important, as you said, to understand that each and every Orthodox Christian has before put before them the call as Elder George of Gregorio says, they've been called to acquire the likeness. Like, yeah. Let's unpack that. That is theosis. So when we, we can say likeness, we can say theosis, we mean the same thing. So let's maybe we can unpack what does it mean to come and become like God, be, by grace become God? Um, the, the good thing about the understanding of the Orthodox Church as revealed by Christ himself and maintained by the Fathers um, cleansed or maintained by the blood, testified by the blood of the martyrs and handed over to us by the saints, mm -hmm. is that theosis is the transformation of the whole person into the person of Christ mm -hmm. by grace. And and another, answer, another very much related topic to the understanding of theosis, which is very confusing for some people, is a lot of people, even among Orthodox Christians, they still believe that grace is created. That's why theosis is a stumbling block to them. Hmm. This, is, this is a Latin scholastic teaching, post-schism, which is a philosophical rereading, essentially, into the gospel, and the idea that it cannot be God himself, because God is simple, right? According to and so it cannot be. So they have a total misunderstanding of the divine energies of God. Yes, that, that's why they, they think it's only it can only be created. But if it's created, then it's not God, and therefore there is no theosis. That's 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 the problem. That's why the theosis is an experiential approach of God to us, and mm. theosis is not possible outside the church. Mm. Mm. That's one thing very very important. I, I like to. A lot of people are, are, are asking me, Father, how, how can you explain that there are good Christians, but they are not Orthodox, but they're living a Christ-like life? Hmm. I explain to them that there's a very thin difference between having Christ in your life and a Christ-centered life. Hmm. Hmm. A Christ-centered life is the person before doing anything, we look at the church calendar, 
before planning a vacation. That's a Christ-centered life. Mm-hmm. Having Christ in your life is a person who goes on vacation and come what may there's a church in the in their place or not. Mm-hmm. The problem with theosis, which people most understand, is that theosis can only be achieved full time. It's never part time. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. That's why I'm telling people, I don't have problem with non-Orthodox. I have problem with Orthodox who keeps on maintaining that Christian life is a part-time life. Mm. If, if, if Christ is not all in all, as the Apostle Paul says, it's not the well, Christ that we have. It's not the Christ-like life. And and we say in the Divine Liturgy and in the, in the Holy Communion when we impart it to the believer to the disciple the the to the member of the body of christ we say not a portion of christ but all of christ yes. is given to him there's no division in christ there can be no dividing christ in every piece uh, every particle of the of the consecrated uh, lamb of god mm-hmm. the, is the whole christ yes and so in the same way if you're if you're achieving likeness your whole body, soul, thoughts, words, deeds, impu- mm-hmm. impulses, glances, yes. decisions, desires, everything is going to be animated and filled with Christ. Yes, that's how it's supposed to be. That's, that's why when people, I, I also heard it, some priest said, no, Jesus prayer is not for you. Like, mm-hmm. how, can, how can you explain to me that Jesus prayer is just for monks or Jesus prayer are just for the Athenites or mm-hmm. worse, Worst term they use in America is the Ephraimites. <laughs> um, if if Jesus prayer are just for them, then what kind of name are you invoking? Mm. The idea of Jesus prayer is to be conscious of your life in Christ, of mm. our sinfulness, but rooted at the mercy of God. That's the that's the idea of the Jesus prayer. It's not it's not about gloom and doom. It's about I am sinful. But God is merciful. Well, one would have to ask. So the Apostle Paul was writing to monks when he wrote the, his epistle and said, "Pray unceasingly." Um, perhaps for some people, they think that Apostle Paul wrote this because time will come in the far future that there will be Ephraimites <laughs> living in America. So it's just for them. And I, I tell people that you see, I, I myself, I tell them, a priest is on whose job only is to preach the gospel. Mm. That's the origin of the priest, not to distort it. Of course, we have some priests who have some certain preferences, but that should be for himself, not for for the teaching of the people. So um, if I hear Roman Catholics saying against things like the church, I wouldn't mind. I am more concerned when priests are acting like heterodox. Mm. Trying to justify things in the name of love, which is not actually love. Because if it is love, it is always rooted for the salvation and the theosis of the person in Christ. Mm. So if you if you if you take away theosis, it's very easy to take away Jesus' prayer. Then after you take away Jesus' prayer, the next thing you take away vigils. Then you take away vigils, what is your what left with you? Just divine liturgy. And when you only have divine liturgy apart from many other services, then your prayer is similar to prayer of any other Christian. Hmm. What's the form of the what's the form of the divine liturgy? So this is the sad thing, and then that's the that's the time that people keeps asking, how come I'm not improving in my spiritual life? Well, you take away so many things in your life. You take away Jesus' prayer, you take away fasting, you take away reading spiritual books. And a lot of people, they read books, but they don't go to vigil. It doesn't work that way. Mm. That's why in the parish here in Las Vegas, they always tell people, it is very, very hypocritical. You go to St. Anthony's Monastery, six hours driving, but you cannot go to the parish for 30 minutes. You become mm. clowns for demons for doing that. Because the mm. moment I was here, the deacon Nicolai blessed that the church is open 24 hours. It's really open 24 hours mm. because the role of the, the, the church is to make sure that people who are sincere in being transformed into the likeness of Christ in this situation in the world will have access to the church. 
Mm. Why the church? Because in the church, we have the Holy Eucharist first and foremost. Secondly, we have the Holy Relics of the Saints, who themselves trans were transformed into Christ. Mm. And Father Dimitri Stanislav is very clear with this. The veneration of the Holy Relics is a key component to the understanding of the sacred scriptures. Mm. So that's why a lot of people don't understand the sacred scriptures, because they think the sacred scriptures are written away from becoming Christ. Hmm. Hmm. We can we cannot take away that's why theos is very, very important, not in terms of discussing it, but discovering it and experiencing it at the bosom of the church. So maybe we can unpack some more practical Im immediate ways for them to make progress in achieving or arriving at theosis. But even saying that, uh, for instance, in the in the writings of Saint Gr Saint Seraphim of Serov in the famous uh, uh, revelation that he had. Uh, about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. He used the term acquisition. But it's a little misleading because it's all a gift in the end, right? We we struggle, we fast, we pray, but it is all a gift of God. He, he actually does everything. He works within us. He brings with him uh, his presence, purification and illumination and deification. He, he is, his presence is, is heaven his presence is theosis his so so then the work we do can we say this it's mainly negative and everything that comes is a gift and it's positive so what we do is we actually are constantly um struggling to get rid of the obstacles get rid of the garbage uh get rid of the uh, uh so don't be an obstacle ourselves to the grace of God. And the Lord says he stands at the door and knocks. So in a way, he's standing at a, he's constantly standing before us saying, let me come and abide in you. Allow me to be, make an abode in you. As the Lord says, the, the, he will take the Father and they will make an abode in, in that who he has prepared. So... The, the, our job is basically to open the door in a thousand different ways every day, every thought, every movement, every moment. We're constantly opening the door to his grace. Would you, would you agree with that? Um, I, I think because um, what, is, what Christ is imparting to us is the healing of our human will that is impaired. That's why there should be a, a willfulness on the part while it is a gift, a perfect gift that is not achieved because of our effort, because of our greatness, or is not impaired because of our worst condition, because God give, gives us a gift not contingent to our behavior. However, because part of the theosis is the healing of the human will, so it mm. becomes like the will of Christ. Mm. Mm. But a lot of people are confusing this understanding that if I subjected my will to the will of Christ, then I become a slave or I'm not anymore myself. Mm. That's why a lot that's why people are against the church because they're thinking, oh, the, the, the spiritual father is um, hovering over me, the spiritual father is controlling me. Mm. And most uh, language of the 80s said, Oh, well, you're being controlled by fear. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, because you're afraid of hell. Or, but the understanding of theosis has nothing to do with hell, has nothing to do with God's punishment, but it's mm -hmm. more of becoming or being Christ himself by grace, not by nature. I was, I was at a parish recently, and the, the priest was talking about the saints as those who've become fully human. Yes. I like that. Yes. Because what that does is it elevates our, the anthropology. It makes the anthropology uh, Christology. In other yeah. words, it, what does it mean to be fully human? It means to be theanthropos katacharin. It means to be a God-man by grace. It means to become like Christ. Fully human is nothing less than theosis. Yes. So I, I think it reorients our understanding. And instead of saying, well, we have to become something other than human or more than human, no, no, no. You, this is the whole. God made. We were made for theosis. Yes. He didn't. He intended Adam and Eve to remain 
and to grow, but they had to participate. There had to be our participation. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, theosis. It would be God making them into godlike. It had no. to be a it had to be a synergy, a, a cooperation. Yes. I think I think that fully human is, is a very good way to to yes. reorient people. That, that's why I, I always tell people when you put the uses into equation, you will have a better understanding of temptation. Mm. Because when you put the uses as part of our the of divine plan for us, then you will understand why it is being allowed by the by the merciful God. Temptation does not come from God, but God allows it. Mm. People are will have a misunderstanding. How can God allow it if He is a merciful God? God allows it because He knew that we can overcome them. Mm. God knows that we can overcome, not to be overcome by them. That is the that's the the, the problem. So there's no temptation. There's no temptation that we cannot uh, avoid. We cannot, let's say, come out victorious. In uh, no, we can only be victorious in Christ. That's the problem. In, of course, in Christ, yes. in course. Because I, yes. like, like for some people, people are talking, Father, but you don't understand depression. Father, you don't. Understand. I said, no human weakness or sickness, even death. We're all banished by Christ. A lot of people mm. have an impaired understanding of Christ. That's why they always separate secular psychology from the psychology of the fathers. That's, mm. the, that's one of the main the main problem. Because uh, in the head, although they believe of a divine Christ, but in the heart, that Christ is actually not the Christ that is revealed in the in, in the incarnate Christ. Because they mm. still doubt that this Christ can heal or can make me um, live in spite of all these problems. It's almost as if we're sitting as the Pharisees when the Lord saw the man lowered from the roof and said, your sins are forgiven and we're doubting in our heads. Can this man forgive sins? And then we, we, we don't believe he can heal, of course. He, and then he heals and we still say, well, yes, but... Uh, you know, can he heal me? You know, it's yeah. almost like we're sitting there like the Pharisees doubting, even though we've been we've been given all of the gifts. Uh, it's a uh, this this is the and this is really the heart of everything in the in the church healing and restoration uh, happens when there's trust, faith, trust. And sickness comes through lack of trust. It's the yeah. it's the dividing line between those who are making progress and those who are sick. Eh? Would you agree? Yes, actually, again, when we talk about the Samaritan woman, mm. the difference between the Samaritan woman and any other person living in adultery or any other person living in idolatry or heresy during the time is that this Samaritan woman deliberately choose to make Christ the center of his upper life. Mm. That's that's the because now she said in the gospel she came to get water but she even forgot the the, the, the jar. Mm. And her main intention now because this is the hallmark of a person who is healed. The main intention now is that she's not she did not anymore choose. Okay, I'm only going to share the good news to those people who did not shame me. I'm not going to share this good news to those people who, who judge me. No, she become concerned and merciful to everyone. And that's how, that, that's the power of Christianity, that mm. we can be as merciful as Christ. Mm. And a lot of people are being prevented from having this because a lot of people are trying to find Christ in worse scenario outside the church. Mm. And a much, much worse scenario outside their hearts. That's, mm. that's the biggest problem. Mm. They, they don't want to find Christ in the church. They want to have a Christ who fits to their idea. I want to have a Christ who will not tell me about moral sins. I don't like a Christ who will tell me that I have to go to church or I have to prepare for communion. Mm. I don't like a Christ who will tell me that I have to be received by baptism. Mm. I don't want a Christ who will tell me that um, repent on sin. 
Uh, we, how about this? We go to confession. It show, this is a, a, a proof that we're not serious about Christ being all in all. We're not serious about the likeness. In other words, theosis. We're not serious about achieving and coming to the likeness. We go to confession and we don't expose our entire self and all of our sicknesses and all of our to the confessor. We keep back what happens, let's say, in our financial transactions mm -hmm. where we might be th doing things that are sick. Maybe we're keeping money that should be going to the poor. Maybe we're even stealing with things. Maybe we're not telling them at all about what's happening behind the closed door of the bedroom. And we think that this is irrelevant to our spiritual life. And whatever we do, it's all free for all and nothing matters. As if the demons don't go in there. <laughs> this is the only room in the whole world that the demons never knock and come in is, is the place where, of course, the whole world is sick today with sexual impurity and sexual yeah. distortion and all the rest. So there seems to be a lot of people, even in the church, who say, yes, I'm Orthodox, yes, I'm Christian, but let's not get too crazy here and think that I have to expose everything. After all, my priest is this, this, and this, or uh, after all, I know better than my priest about this, this, and this. And so as long as that's happening... We're not serious about theosis, likeness, Christ being all in all in our, in our life. That's true. That's why I always tell people, please be, be mindful. Some I, I have to admit it. A lot of priests are plain lazy, particularly in the parish. And a lot of priests would rather, this is the problem. I see it a bigger problem. A lot of priests would rather cut short the catisma or even not pray it, but they have a very long coffee hour. I don't understand that. Mm. Why I emphasize the katisma? If a person keeps on hearing the sound, they are very beautiful. There are so many things we can get from the sound. But one thing I like it very, very consoling, it is said that he who made the eyes, do you think he cannot see? Mm. Who made the ears, do you think he cannot hear? Mm. It speaks of our anthropology, of how much God loves us, of how much God takes care of us and how much God impart the same sight and the same hearing to us so that we will not have any other reason but to become like Him. That's why I tell people, one of the benefits when, when, when you go to Vespers, you, you have the understanding of time. And once the person has an understanding of time, the person will understand that the time given to us on earth is just enough. It's just enough for us to be transformed into Christ through love within the church and with the, with the holy mysteries. Mm -hmm. And the person will spend 20 years of that life regretting or being angry at someone. We are losing opportunity to become like Christ. Mm -hmm. But like Christ, we can transform the injustices we can transform everything if we bring it at the foot of Christ and say, Lord, I deserve this kind of situation, but please help me. Mm -hmm. I, this one thing I like with the Lord. When, when you say, Lord, I, I, I deserve this, but please help me. Mm -hmm. It attracts God's grace. Yes. No one who said to the Lord, please help me, was left unaided. Mm. <laughs> This is something I find myself in the confession, but also with the teaching. Many people, they, doesn't, they don't think. They say, Father, I have, it just doesn't come to them. They don't consider it. Father, I have these problems. I said, have you gone to the Lord and asked your help? No, I haven't asked the help of the Lord. Well, why? You're coming to me a man, but you haven't stood in front of the icon and mm -hmm. asked the Lord who's all powerful. Many times we don't think, first go to the Lord. I have a problem with this person. I have a problem with this passion. I have a problem with this whatever, everything. Uh, he cares about everything uh, in our life. And once all of, again, Christ is all in all. There's nothing in our life that he doesn't have some uh, goal for it, plan for it. And it has a part to play in our whole pedagogy and our whole tr transfiguration. Yes, it's amazing. Cool. That's why when we, but we have to learn it from the saints. That's the most important part. Mm. Because another part, a problem I have seen, 
I'm a very young priest, but what I've seen with people I've encountered with is that people fell into delusion. They we promote ourselves as saints. Like mm. I, <laughs> can you imagine how much Saint Joseph the Hesychast endured? Mm. Can you imagine how many Jesus prayer? Can you imagine even Saint Paisio somehow doubted Saint Joseph the Hesychast? Mm. Doubting another saint. Can you mm. imagine how much? But how was he able to endure this? Because he only has one thing in life. His life is centered on Christ. And this gift given to St. Paisius, to St. Porphyrius, to St. Joseph de Sacas, to Elder of Arizona, is freely given to all of us. Mm. It's, not, it's, not, it's not selected people. It's freely given to all of us. The problem is that we do not want to choose a Christ-centered life. Mm. Because a Christ-centered life will show us first how, shel- how selfish we are. Mm and how self-dependent we are. Unless we depend from this, there's no healing. Maybe it would be helpful to talk about the hierarchy of things. I, I find that um, people come and they say, Father, my life is very, uh, it's unfulfilled. I don't know what, you know. I, and I say, well, what do, you, what, is, what do you put at the top of the list? What's at the top of your hierarchy? Well, I want to accomplish this, this, and this in my life. Oh, well, that's why you're unfulfilled, because those things are not good to fill you. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't, we, we need to hierarchize or prioritize the things. So if we wake up and we say, first God, then my neighbor, and mm-hmm. then me. Mm-hmm. So, but instead we put first me, and then, oh, yes, and I'll go to church as well at some point. Uh, maybe just Sunday, and then mm. oh, my neighbor, yeah, I need to do something once in a while to show that I love my neighbor. And then we're, we've, we are unfulfilled in life. But how can we, who are empty, fill ourselves? You're saying you're getting a gift from your own self, your own desires, and you're always looking outside. You look at life, what is it going to give me? I'm going to acquire from life something. I'm going to get... This from this sport or this money or this pursuit, I'm going to get something that is going to fulfill me. It's just the opposite, though. Fulfillment comes when we empty ourselves and we serve and live for God and our neighbor. Then we feel fulfilled. It's just the opposite. And so I think many times we don't have the hierarchy proper. Mm -hmm. And we not just theoretically, every day we have to reorient ourselves and check ourselves and say, okay, what am I living for? What's the most important thing today? Who am I directing all of my energy for? Yes. Yes. It's, like, it's a balance of self-awareness and awareness of God's mercy. Mm. Mm. And how to have this balance. I, I, I always tell to a lot of people, just by the moment you open your eyes, what pulls you? A lot of people are pulled to continue sleeping. Then I told them, you are subjecting yourself already to pleasure. The moment you sleep, the moment you wake up, you have a choice either to submit myself to a few more minutes of pleasure or immediately, immediately, as I open my eyes, make prostrations. Ask mm. glory to thee, O God, for a new day. Glory to thee, O God, for the hope that you have started in us. Glory to God for my family. Glory to God for my parish. Glory to God for everything. Mm. And then as I always tell people, I'm living now in the state of Nevada. I tell them Nevada has the highest rate of abortion and divorce. Mm. Highest rate. And I tell people in the parish, if you are disturbed by the LGBTQ agenda, but you are not praying, for God to stop abortion, to bring to repentance those who are involved in abortion in whatever form, and you are not praying to God about the preservation of marriage, the protection of young people away from any sexual sin and corruption, the protection of young men and women, that they will not choose um, pleasure things over spiritual life. We are living in hypocrisy. Mm. That's why I told that's the reason why we open the church 24 hours. I tell them once you start being um, focused on your own drama, 
and realizing that the world is suffering because we have taken Christ out of the center. Mm. That's the reason why we have abortion. That's the reason why we have, because man is the center. Mm. But the moment God is the center, the family is very beautiful. Mm. I, I, I say it when we have parishioners, before they will go to vacation, they will say, Father, are, are we missing a particular feast? Because mm. if we're missing a, fe a feast, we will move our vacation. Mm. What, what does this tell you? And then I told the person, what are you teaching your children when you do this? You're teaching your children that we can never compromise our orthodox faith over pleasure or over pain. And I tell them, demons are not very smart, actually. They only have few tools, pain and pleasure. Mm. Very smart. But the moment we, 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 we follow the church through Vespers, through Vigil, through parapet, I tell them, you have problems, go to the church, have monument. You have problems, go pray with an apathist. A young couple, they're not, yet, they're not yet married, I tell them, so let's now start devotion with St. Peter and Febronia. Mm. Pray, it should start with Christ and it will end in perfection. Mm. Nothing, if we start with, with anything else, it will always lead to imperfection. But mm. everything started in Christ. That's why you're talking about Father the goals. The, the first goal is to, 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 to see the Gospel of Apostle Matthew. Seek the kingdom first. Mm. When you seek the kingdom, be sure to belong to the kingdom. That's why baptism is very, very important. And every time people will argue with me about baptism, I always tell them, be sure when you die, you go to heaven and start arguing with St. Nicholas Cabasilas. Because mm. I'm simply articulating to you what I have read from St. Nicholas Cabasilas. If you have a problem with that, be sure when you die, you go to heaven and spend the rest of eternity proving to St. Nicholas Cabasilas that we should receive people just by any other means, not with baptism. Mm. Mm. Don't argue with me. I'm nothing. But mm. argue with St. Nicholas and all the other saints. Start with St. the Baptist. Start mm. with St. the Baptist. Well, and, the, and again, Christ all in all. So there's nothing that happens in the church which is not for our salvation. So when we put something aside, we minimize it, we marginalize it, we uh, whatever, we are essentially doing harm to our own salvation, right? We're doing harm to our own fullness and the likeness that Christ is calling us to. Uh, let, maybe we can talk a little bit again about the Jesus prayer. I'm thinking that this is extremely important today. There's so, uh, of course, our great, the great elder friend, when he came to America, he came basically with one thing in his heart and in his hand, and that was the, the prayer rope and the Jesus prayer. And that was, the, <laughs> that was what powered him. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the whole 30, 40 years that he lived in, in the United States and, and worked in the United States. So he worked so hard for everyone to say the prayer. Yeah. And I still find that people are very uneducated about the essence, essence of it. But in particular, what I, I learned the following, and you can let me know, maybe we can talk about this aspect of it. Theologically speaking, what we see happening in the prayer is this is is both purification and illumination simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Because when we call upon Jesus to and to have mercy, we do that in the Holy Spirit. And what is what we're essentially calling upon is the Holy Spirit to come and to cleanse us. And that the presence of the Holy Spirit both cleanses and in, and enlightens at the very same time. Simultaneously, you're being cleansed and you're being enlightened by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So you're constantly calling upon Christ to send and bring, like on Pentecost again, Him, His presence, the presence of the divine energies, Himself, the uncreated grace, and that that is what purifies and that is what illumines. And so, and then what besides it? Because I think that maybe many people think about the Jesus prayer as, a, as something that happens here. And here only, in the mind and in the lips. And of course, if it just is in the mind and the lips, then it's not it's not working throughout all of man to do the work that it's intended. 
So this whole process of, of bringing it down into the heart, which is, and is it, just, it, can we say, I would say it includes, but it cannot, it, it's not only about compunction and contrition, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to, you have to have the pain of heart for the prayer to work. Yes. But it's more than that. Yes. Do you have any thoughts about it? Yes. Um, actually, always, I think in the previous interview, interview always, I, I, I mentioned it already, um, a lot of people who like to separate, they would like to have a, a joyful Christ. But the, the, under, the misunderstanding of this joy is the, the taking away of pain. And that's what makes psychology or many other forms or um, humanisms attracted to some people who are in pain because the desire is just simply to elevate the pain. Mm. The problem which most people don't understand, just the, par the, the, the paradigm we take from, um, from a woman who's uh, giving birth to a, to a child. This is in the Psalms as well. And it's the metaphor that's given to us to understand that the, the joy that comes from us or come handed given to us by Christ is the joy that comes from the cross. That's why the third antiphon is very clear. Blessed are those who mourn. So there should be an important aspect of mourning. But our mourning should not be psychological mourning. We should be mourning for not being able to utilize our time in making ourselves in the person of Christ. That's what we should be mourning on. Like, I have wasted so much time watching TV. I have wasted so much time holding on to anger. I have wasted so much time on not making Christ the center of my life. This is what we should be mourning on. And when a person more, when the person understands that there is something that causes his pain, and I'm the one causing my pain, and the resides the Jesus prayer, then he will understand that he will, is in the same position as those people who have called on the name of the Lord and were healed. Mm. But, but that's the problem when people um, try to do the Jesus prayer out of formality. Mm. Some mm. people will have a very big prayer room in the church, but they don't have the same prayer room inside their room. Mm. It doesn't mm. work that way. Some no. people, they like to um, appear pious, like mm. right. Like the Pharisees. Like the Pharisee. <laughs> so all these things. So the problem is not in the Jesus prayer. The problem is in the attitude of those people who, that's, that's why I understand some clergy said, oh, don't follow them, don't follow the epimites because they are fanatics. The problem is not on those people who are doing it wrong. The problem is for those people who are not doing it properly. Mm. And that's, that, that includes all of us. Mm. When we call upon the name of Christ, we should have the same trust that the same Christ who walked on earth in the flesh, who restored mm. the sight of the blind, mm. can lovingly restore us to the very person who, who he is. Mm. So, you, said something, you said something important, I think, that uh, reminded me of something recently. Uh, the mourning, the pain of heart, uh, and all of the beatitudes. If we, if it's not for Christ and in Christ, then it's going to be ultimately egotistical and worthless. Yes. So someone wrote me recently, uh, a suffering soul, and she asked me, uh, I'm, "I weep uh, uncontrollably at times." And I said, "Well, what are you, what are you weeping for?" Well, I am weeping for. She told me things, and I said, "Well, this is this. This is for Christ. Uh, this is for the loss of Christ. This is for the love of Christ. This is for your sins. No, none. What you told me, none of that. So, is this weeping is not the weeping that's unto salvation. That's a fruit of the spirit. That's a." It's a self-centered weeping that you're not getting what you want, or you're not you 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 you're sad about these things. There's a melancholy that yeah. you, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for people to understand that it's not just pain. Generally, it's not pain for our for our not getting what we want or something like. That. It's obviously when we say pain of heart, 
it has love in it and love for God and love for man. It has a pain of heart, which is a compunction, a contrition. It has, it has a, a, uh, you know, a blessedness because it's bringing us closer to the likeness. It's making us more like Christ. And, and if it's not, then it's not, then it's not of Christ. So it, all, all of these things that we talk about in the church, everything is meant to operate for our salvation, which means likeness, which means to become like Christ yeah. and acquire the virtues, to be filled with the virtues. Yes, the, to, to become like, to, the only goal, God only created us to become like him. God mm -hmm. created us to become like him. I think this is this the, all of our fathers, even the fathers in the West, unfortunately, because they have changed so much in not only in their theology, but also in their piety, in their liturgy. That's why they cannot make sense of this. They cannot see it in their prayers. The moment they, they concoct or rationalize that grace is created, and you lost everything. He mm. just lost everything. Yeah, this also reminds me of something we were talking about before we started, and that is that when you see someone talking about uh, either saying theosis is not the end of our life, Mm -hmm. or that grace is created, this is a confirmation that they did not have the experience of theosis and therefore of salvation, and therefore they're, they're outside the church. Would that, that's, isn't that right? Yes, that's true. That, that, that's why that, that's the importance of discernment. Because when you see, that's, that, I always tell people, look for a priest who talks about theosis. Mm. Because the priest who talks about theosis will never neglect the Holy Liturgy, the Divine Liturgy, the Eucharist. The mm. priest whose focus is theosis will never lose sight of the proper dogmatic consciousness of the Church. Mm. Mm. The priest who is focused on theosis will not, will not have a personality call. Like I told them, but you notice this, a lot of intellectual people, academic theologians, they will write about anything and everything except theosis mm. because it's an absence of the divine experience not because god does not want us to experience it but because we refuse it because the prerequisite to theosis is genuine repentance and repentance is not about being sad about but repentance is not um, in um, having the ability to surrender to God everything in spite of all the pain. Mm. That's the very that's very difficult. A lot of people say, Oh, I love Christ. No. No. A lot of people they we, we love the Lord by our lips. That's why I, I, I tell people, immerse yourself with the gospel, then you will understand the Psalms. And when you understand the Psalms, you will understand the whole prayers of the church. Everything will make sense. Because mm. the psalm is speaks about the person of Christ. Hmm. I feel sad when so many parishes and so many priests, brother priests, our brother priests, discourage people from reciting catechisms. He said, oh, it's for monks. It's not for monks. It, it's the prayer of the church. It hmm. is the prayer of the church. Hmm. So I, that's why for me, initially, when people ask me for a prayer, I tell them, first read the Gospels and then read Catechism 17. The white mm -hmm. 17 during the day because it will and they, they they have shared it to me after years months of having this discipline particularly reading the Catechism 17 it helps them understand themselves better mm -hmm. they still have problems but they're not wallowing with problems because they understand these problems is necessary for me to mourn because mm -hmm. without problem I, I told them look at look at King David when he was four when he was poor as a shepherd, he was very obedient to God. But once he was touched by richness, what happened to him? What happened? Mm. So this is the problem with when we when we have false anthropology, but when we have proper understanding of ourselves, the weakness of our human will, but such weakness can be energized by the divine grace, the uncreated mm. grace. Yes, this is a paradox that if you that is hard to logically understand, but it's very self-evident to me, and, and it's in the patristic writings, and that is that theognosia, knowledge of God, is impossible without aftognosia, which is knowledge of self. 
and vice versa. You can't know yourself unless you know God. So coming back to theosis, can one reach self-knowledge without theosis as the clear aim, understanding, purpose, and practice the goal of our life? Can you come to self-knowledge? You can have a, a false knowledge of the self. We have a false knowledge of the self because our true identity is only in Christ. That's right. You, you will only see portions of, of the person, the fallen man. You will see yeah. aspects. But you, if you don't see Christ, who uh, you're made in his image. Yes, that's the so problem. So if, if you don't see him clearly, you won't understand yourself clearly. No. That's why people until now divorce psychology as if it is outside the church. Our true identity is in the person of Christ. But the person of Christ can only be understood within the church and live by the sacraments. Without the sacra without the Holy Eucharist, there's no understanding of Christ. There's no understanding of Christ. And That's therefore why I always know right. to people, look at some priests. Some priests they, they, they talk about everything, but they never participate in the divine liturgy. Hmm. They, they they don't prioritize it. But look at some priests, they don't they don't talk much. But everything is about the divine liturgy. Mm. Everything divine liturgy. This also points, I think, Father, because we're talking about theosis, we're talking about the Jesus prayer, we're talking about self-knowledge and God knowledge. This also points to why the church is so strict about heresy and yeah. about about wrong teaching. Because if you, if again you if, if salvation and self-knowledge is impossible without the knowledge of God, and if you have an idea about God that is wrong, especially the idea that, that, there, that you're not able to participate in his uncreated energies, the people who deny theosis or accept created grace, unfortunately, like the Latin uh, Catholicism, they, they talk about created grace, which is impossible. There's no such thing as created grace. There's only uncreated grace because it is God himself. So if that's if that if we talk about created grace or we deny theosis as the aim of our life which unfortunately apparently Pope Shenouda the, the famous Coptic pope for many many years he's reposed now he apparently denies that the patristic inheritance puts that as the goal and the aim and the purpose of our life which is unbelievable to me it's tragic but in any case, if that's the case, if that is happening, denial of it outright or denial of it in essence because you don't accept the uncreated energies and divine energies and participating in them, which is a classical view, uh, it's among some in the West, then you can never achieve theosis. In other words, salvation is impossible. So it's all connected. And that's why the church is so should be so careful about orthodoxy, about yes. the right teaching. Yes. Theos, the understanding of the, any, any person who starts with theosis can never, never discuss theosis without discussing also heresy. Mm. Because when we talk about theosis, we're talking about the person of Christ, who he, as he revealed himself in the church, he has one person, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the eternal word of God. I tell people the five, five fingers, two natures, two wills. So one person, two natures, two wills. Mm. At the moment you only have one will, Christ, he cannot impart something to you. And this is not my this is not me. If you the, the will it, remains, the will remains, if it's not assumed, it doesn't, it's not healed. Yes. That's why it's a great, 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 great theologian, yes. That's why it's not possible. That's why we say when a priest talks about theosis, it is inevitable that the priest will also speak about heresy. Hmm. So it's not if the priest is just talking about theosis, but not talking about what prevents theosis. This heresy is unrepented sins. It's a hmm. product of heresy. So you will not a true discussion of theosis, just like true discussion of Christ is talking about his mercy and his justice. Can you imagine a doctor never talking about the sickness? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Uh, only, 
only about what a healthy person is, but but people are sick. You have to talk to them about the nature of the sickness and how you fall into and what lifestyle leads to this sickness. Yeah. And how the sickness. You know, both. You have to always yeah. together, both and as we say, both the one and the other have yeah. to be so that people when, when the pastor or whatever religious leader you are you are dealing with only presents to you a Christ who is just making giving gifts, but not the Christ who heals. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. false repentance as part of and doesn't healing. call to repentance. Yes. How many people are not calling us, us to repentance today? But before we repent, we have to understand what we are wrong about. Yes, like the sins. Like I'm very vocal about this. I, I tell people, um, what happened during pandemic? B prevention of venerating the icons. Mm. It not come from the government. It comes from our ranks, from our clergy. And they, again, you can explain a lot. You can use many other words. But why do we have to venerate the icon? Not because of pride, not because of, of um, delusion, piety, but because dogma heals. Dogma guarantees the healing of the person into becoming Christ. That's the function of, that's why sense of prony is very clear of having a dogmatic consciousness mm. we have to learn from the saints and if people said oh it's a, no we cannot make excuse oh because bishop so and so no what is wrong is wrong what is mm. wrong we can make it we can make it sound nice that's true but still wrong mm. okay we can make it sound cute but still wrong and the good thing about the church is that at the moment we admit we are wrong and we repent that's it. There's no need for a long drama. Yeah, you can't think about another example here. You can't think about repentance if you don't think about what you're re what you're reorienting toward. Yes, because repentance is re is a reorientation toward Christ, mm -hmm. and you can't talk about Christ without repentance because then you you're acting like it's not necessary to reorient ourselves to Christ. You have to talk about the whole process of of, of unity with God. And uh, the Lord talks about it continually. Yes, that, that, almost, of, almost all the stories of the gospel are filled with one who's reorienting himself toward yeah. Christ. There's one, there's one pastor, I have, I've seen the video, I have so many followers, and the pastor claimed that there's nothing in the scripture that the Lord speaks about repenting from sins. And I, in my mind, the very first word of the Lord in the Holy Gospel of Apostle Mark is not, it's not read the Bible. It's not have a personal relationship with me. Repent. <laughs> so a lot of people don't understand that the call for repentance is the call for rejoicing. That's why the church is the herald of repentance because she is the, she is, she alone can call us to rejoice with mm. those who have been with the saints mm. because when do we when do we rejoice most even on a human level when we're united to those we love yes that's true and I, I, as a former marriage as a former marriage counselor i tell people what you observe what you observe with couples the moment you, you are arguing with one another you are furious you are you are very you, you are not free from anger but the moment you realize your mistake and admit it you don't you also discovered how loving the other person is to you you understand oh so i have been this stupid for that long and this person still put up with me so you see even in the psychological aspect at the psychological level the awareness of one's shortcomings and the willfulness to please the other person to be changed so that the other person will be happy it's the same crisis to us he changed he changed from from being an invisible god to a visible god to us mm -hmm. so he can be close to us that's why the, the the good thing about the eucharist is that it is the perfect covenant that god cannot be separated with us anymore mm. because you mentioned the eucharist you mentioned the eucharist and it also leads me to another aspect of theosis Yes. It, it's a, the Eucharist is the condemnation of all Gnosticism. 
Yes. And it's all, all, all ideas of salvation which do not incorporate the body. Yes. Because the Eucharist means that to be truly saved, to achieve the likeness, to be deified, glorified, to reach theosis, you have to include the body. You have to have a the physical communion of the body and blood, the bread and the wine, which becomes the body and blood. You have to consume that. So another aspect of theosis is this, in, in the inclusion of the body. So the body has to become like yeah. Christ, not yeah. just the spirit of the soul, the soul of man, which includes prostrations, fasting, almsgiving. The body has to participate in everything. And I think that's also something that we're very surrounded by Gnosticism today and this heretical uh, idea of salvation and the new age and all this. Even a lot of Protestantism is Gnostic. It doesn't talk, of course, there's no Eucharist in most Protestants today. They don't talk, understand. So another aspect is how often are you participating in the Holy Communion? And how are you approaching Holy Communion? If you're not properly approaching and, and, and often, then you will not make progress in achieving the likeness with and theosis. Yeah, that's true. So I probably I always tell people read the, the, the work of uh, Hieromon Georgios, the one of the revered abbot, abbots of Gregorian Monastery. He, he, he wrote a commentary on the Holy Eucharist. The Divine Liturgy is very, very nice. For some people who are more academic in terms of their approach, textbook-like approach, Father Emmanuel Sadakis wrote uh, commentary in divine liturgy mm -hmm. but for me i always tell people first gospels meaning for inquirers because they don't they cannot have the eucharist first but never divorce the reading of the gospel from the life of the church mm -hmm. because only the church can explain the sacred scriptures because she produces it mm -hmm. and the scriptures is only understood within the holy eucharist mm -hmm. without the eucharist the, that's why i always tell people I find it very problematic when people are more attracted. They can go visit, go miles, visiting a mere streaming icon, traveling miles, visiting a mere streaming icon, but can never go to the parish to have the divine liturgy. I told them this is terribly wrong. This reminds me of an event I had very early in Orthodoxy 30 years ago. I was in Chicago and there was a mere streaming icon of the Mother of God of Chicago at the Antiochian Parish. And I was sitting there, and Bishop Basil of the Antiochian Archdiocese, now retired Bishop of Wichita, he was talking. And they were asking him, you know, this is a miracle. And he said, yes, it's a miracle, but we have a miracle every Sunday, a divine liturgy, a far greater miracle. The great miracle of the body and blood, uh, the bread and wine becoming the body and blood of Christ. We live with miracles yes. every, every day. Yes. And I like that very much. That that was one of the things that really s s stayed with me. Uh, it puts everything in perspective, and it, you realize that uh, everything God gives ultimately has to come back to the communion of the body and blood. Uh, otherwise, it's 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 stillborn. Yes. It's not going to bring about change. And if you go to the icon that's Mur gushing as a as someone who goes to a uh, you know a circus like you know the Dostoevsky says that people want bread in circuses. If you go there as someone going to see a uh, an event and a mm -hmm. and a show, well, you've gone. Uh, it's pointless. It's worthless. Yeah. You know. I, I tell people how many mere streaming icons have stopped. Streaming meal. A lot of them. But the mm. church has never stopped offering divine liturgy. Mm. The church has never stopped nourishing us by the very body and blood of the Lord. So I'm not I'm not against meal streaming icon. I like them. I collect meal for my fellow Filipinos. I give it to, to parishes. But for me, this should po point you to Christ. And even tell it to my to, to my fellow Filipinos. If my priesthood is not pointing you to Christ, I would appreciate if you're the first to condemn me. Mm. Because that at least would help me. Our mm. priesthood, our Christianity, our marriage, our parenting should only be directed to the person of Christ. 
It's a very big one. You think we're problematic with marriage because the marriage is not centered in Christ. Well, and that pointing to Christ, again, does not mean pointing to him uh, in history or pointing no. to him in the pages of scriptures only or yeah. mainly, but pointing to him in the living presence yeah. in the church, which means the divine Eucharist and all the mysteries mm -hmm. and, and our participation in the mysteries. Mm -hmm. uh, the priest's main purpose is to bring everyone. He's a mystagogue which means he's initiating you into the mysteries and the mystery of the incarnation and the mystery of the church. Mm -hmm. And if he's not doing that, it's a tragedy. It was. But why, why do I have to become orthodox? Because you would like to become like Christ. Mm. If, you, if you don't have to become like Christ, we're not going to force orthodoxy to you. Yes. But you have, you have the image, but the likeness can only, is only possible within the church. Within the baptism, confession, tradition of the church, prayers, and the peak of this is the divine Eucharist. I, I'm afraid that many of, among the heterodox and maybe among some orthodox, they think that they've arrived when they've acquired a tremendous amount of knowledge about Christ, about the church, about the history, about the theology. Uh, they've learned perhaps all the uh, prayers by heart, they've learned the divine liturgy or, or, or whatever by heart, and they've become experts. They've become experts in, and they could probably teach a class or two maybe, or they could become professors. And they think this is this is what God is calling us to. And, and you know, if it wasn't so tragic, it might be funny that we've made acquiring knowledge about it's almost it's barlamism yes that's the problem it's barlamism it's not it's we've lost sight of oh, that's exactly what barlam said we acquire you become an intellectually very uh, you know knowledgeable about things and you perfect your reason and you've that's the purpose of your life in christ mm -hmm. it's heretical mm -hmm. That's why I'm surprised with some conferences happening around in America, some Orthodox conferences happening in America. I attended a particular conference in America, and what the, the, the very first thing that is neglected is the prayer. But attended by monastics, by bishops, but and then the, the prayer, and then ask why why are we not praying? Oh, because there are some people here like so I said. Yeah. Anyway, this is kind of confusing. That's why I always tell my fellow Filipinos who are under our spiritual care, I don't give any blessing for anyone to participate in online debates or any online discussion. I tell them, first, your knowledge in, about the Orthodox Church are limited to those things that you have already endured or suffered for. If you haven't suffered this, you're not. don't speak about this. Mm. Don't speak to you. I told them, but oh, I like theosis. No. I myself, I did not achieve theosis. But the only reason I'm talking about this is because I would like to give to make people understand that this is the center of our Orthodox faith. And mm. part of my priestly function is to teach the people about mm. the faith. I haven't achieved it, and there's no none of us achieve it in this life. It's only achieved in the life to come, but started here. Mm. But I thought that it's very important for us to bring into the open. Don't mm. talk about many other things. A lot of people say, I, I like to know about this. Uh, Father, how about reading Pelopalia? This is nice. If, you are, if your heart is guided by someone more experienced than you. But if you read the Pelopalia and start applying it to other people, like, oh, this priest is not nasty, or oh, this priest is fat, this priest is like, then you're. So we, we, were, we might want to say that when you say it's not achieved in this life, you want to say that it's not fully achieved yes, in this life. It's not perfect in this life. It's, it's perfect. Here. Yeah. Because a lot of people, I, people are saying, Father, how come we still commit sin? Because I told them God wants us to be victorious. That's why we have to com not to commit sin, but we, we are uh, attacked by the situ situation. And I have a because now I'm living in Las Vegas for a year, and in Las Vegas is surrounded by mountains. So I tell the parishioners, if you think that you're so holy enough, you can go out of the parish and start commanding the mountains to move. 
If one of them move, then we will all pray to God and glorify you. But as long as you are not moving any mountains yet in the state of Nevada, and you are not pouring snow in the state of Nevada, please don't think you're above the church. Don't mm. start judging people, no. Mm. But even the saints who have who performed miracles would dare not to judge because they know the implication for this is very, very difficult in spiritual life. Mm. But again, so I also don't want to fall to the other end because people are saying, oh, but how about some priests teaching us the right things? They are not judging. I told them, I, the fathers, our sins are very clear. If it's about myself, I can endure everything. But if it's about dogma, we should speak. If it's about the teachings in the person of Christ, if it's about the liturgical life of the church, all of us should speak together. Just like I said during COVID, it would have been more pleasing to the Lord if all the bishops, if all the priests would have made one voice and said, we will bring out our holy icons, we will bring out our holy relics, and we will beg God we will mm. beg God to show his mercy. Mm. And I'm speaking, I'm, I'm speaking of this as someone because some people think, oh, you don't know COVID. I had it. I had it for 59 days. So I'm not speaking out of the blue. I'm mm. saying that if only we could have done this, whether people have died of it or people have were healed from it, it doesn't matter. Because the important aspect is not the healing away from COVID. But the important aspect is the making of the human will into mm. the will of Christ. That in mm. spite of whether it's COVID, where is this, we should be one with Christ. Maybe we can close with the following, just a quick discussion. We see fruits of the of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the contemporary saints and elders. And some of the things we see are the gifts of God, um, which unbelievably to some of us might it might be hard to understand, but they're actually among the great gifts that come to those who have reached high levels of spiritual life. We might call them in the realm of theosis after great illumination. You see things like uh, what we say in Greek, uh, clairvoyance. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then also there's, there's the, uh, the idea that you see not only the prophetically the future but you also see in the in the inside of the soul of the man the, the odyssey you can the voice the god illumines for instance in the life of elder Ephraim, he was so purified and so illumined and prayer, prayed constantly that jesus prayer had it in his heart that god allowed him to know the hearts of his of his the people confessing to him and he revealed and i've heard this from many people personal friends of mine he revealed their whole life to them yes, yes. Revealed and and told them what they needed to confess for instance so these are gifts of the spirit but i was reading and hearing an elder recently that said that these are lower end gifts <laughs> and i chuckled i said these things are so beyond us and yet in a way they're considered lower and one of the reasons why they're given is the main reason why they're given is not for the person the saintly person, but precisely because it is going to help the salvation of his neighbor. So God is working through this person and and essentially doing mission and pastoral work. And for the sake of the person, he gives them these gifts. And so it's, it's God working. And so the person doesn't say, well, these are my gifts. And he feels that uh, he's achieved something, you know, where for, from us, we look at it, we say, well, this is an amazing, well, how could he maintain that and not become proud? Well, precisely because he feels it totally God and not him. It's he and he recognizes that it's God's work and it's for the, not for his purpose and for his sake, but for the sake of of the neighbor. And I'm saying all this because I want people to, to realize that the fruit of the fruit of theosis, the, the people who arrive in this life to a degree of theosis, and that's God determines that. That God determines who achieve, achieves in this life a degree of theosis and manifests that. To other people and for his purposes but you see that they're for the sake of love and the sake of the neighbor and the sake of the body of christ it's always for it, it, the gifts of god are always for salvation and not 
selfishly for one person, but for the whole body. Okay. And and so if we if we make progress on the path of salvation, we're not going to be filled with any. What we'll be filled with is that which is going to be beneficial and building up the body of Christ and good for our neighbor. It's always going to be just like our Lord. Everything he did, he did for the salvation of everyone else. So the same thing with a person who makes progress in theosis and the likeness, becoming like Christ. What will be the fruit? What will be the the end result? That those around him will be benefited. He'll live for them and for God. It will be a greater increase in love. It will be a greater increase in communion. These are the things that show forth. It's, it's not going to be, um, you know, I don't know, a guru type of, um, you know, Matt wonder worker or something. And uh, I, I think there's very bizarre ideas of what theosis is in the minds of a lot of people. Yes, the moment we understand theosis away from the church, that is not theosis. Mm. When we read books and we we like what we read during theosis, but we are um, afraid of the services of the church, that's not theosis. Mm. Same thing. Same thing in relationship. Like people talk about love. If you love, if you say you profess you love the person but you are not willing to sacrifice, that's not love. Mm. Theosis, that's why the Lord tells us, that's why I like, the, the reason why I like Theosis because it captures what the Lord divide, gave us the highest command. He said that, love as I have loved you. Mm. By His grace, we are capable of loving like Him. Mm. And that is very, very beautiful. If, if husbands and wives will be capable of loving like Christ, there are no divorce. There are no abortion. Of course. There are no abortion. And it's interesting that there has to, if you understand God is love, and he says, God, St. John says God is love, then he could not remain alone. No. He had to. He had to. It was an extension of his very being that he created man. Because we just said love is not love if it's not given away. It's a famous mm -hmm. saying, right? So God as love, there must be a theosis for man. These mm -hmm. things are inseparable. Yes. That's why it's not possible for Orthodox to have like a personal savior. Like I just confess, Lord, you're my savior. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have always moved to love someone else because we are loved. Mm. Only someone who is who experienced God's love loves the other person, and this and of is, course, and the image of love is the cross. Yes, and the divine liturgy. I said, you know, you, in the way it's very, very beautiful. You give bread, God gives us blood and blood. Mm. You give little sacrifice, God gives the Holy Spirit. Mm. You give blood, you receive the Spirit. Mm. So, but there's always the giving and the getting, the giving and the getting. Mm. We mm. give up our frail human will. God heals it into his will and transforms us into his likeness. Mm. So I think this is very beautiful and I hope and I pray that a lot of people will will continuously struggle towards theosis, not just simply uh, checking what kind of cross they're making, what form of hand, or this way or this way. But mm. all of this should be understood as something centered on the person of Christ. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. For joining us today yes. Yes. And, uh, and giving us spiritual food for the road, for the journey, the narrow path. I wish you uh, safe travels. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes. And uh, maybe, maybe we'll see you in the fall, as we spoke about. Yes. But uh, uh, have a wonderful summer and pray for us. Thank you, Father, by your prayers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Glory to God.